Hello, everyone. Welcome to our very first uh, Common Ground 2019 uh, conversation training webinar. Uh, my name is Stephanie Thompson, and I'm here with a wonderful group um, who are going to help facilitate our webinar today with you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, this is a little bit of an experiment for us. We last year did several conversation trainings and they were all in person and those were great because you actually had a chance to um, get in touch with people and, and meet them one-on-one -on -one and sit down and dig into the format. But, um, you know, it's hard to, to get together on a, on a work day and, and take that time out of your schedule. So we wanted to really offer the opportunity for people to come together online and view it at their, at their convenience. So um, thank you for joining us live today as we work this out. But this video is also being recorded and will be available on our YouTube for people to review after the fact. So everything we do here today is going to be preserved in perpetuity. <laughs> Take that with a grain of salt. <laughs> but I'm also sharing that to let you know that this is a big uh, experiment and, and we are, um, bear with us if we have a few technical hiccups because we are still kind of figuring out the best way to show, show, show video, show you the screen. Um, but we appreciate you, uh, your patience and helping out as we, as we test this system out. So let me introduce uh, a few folks here around the table. Should we go around the table actually and introduce ourselves? Sure. Um, I'm, as I said, I'm Stephanie Hicks Thompson. Why don't we start here on the other side of the table? I'm Lila Mills with Neighborhood Connections. Dawn Arrington with IOB. Erica Brown with Neighborhood Connections. Nicole Yap, I'm the Common Ground Fellow here at the Cleveland Foundation. Tony Vento with Purpose Matters and consulting with Neighborhood Connections. Excellent. Thanks, everybody. And this group is going to help us um, share the different processes and methods of our Common Ground conversation today. Um, and I'm very grateful to them because they are in this experiment along with us. So with that, Erica, do you want to take it off? Take off? Hi, everyone. Erica Brown. Um, so what we're going to start with, which you can see on your screen, is a check-in question. And this will actually be part of your Common Ground Day conversations on June 30th. And the reason why we do a check-in question, it's a practice that we use all the time at Neighborhood Connections in our Neighborhood Gatherings, and you can use them anywhere, Common Ground being one of those places, is you do a check-in question in order to prime the room. So what you want to do is give people an opportunity to put their voices in the room. So it's practice for what's going to come in a way. So if everyone gets to say something in the space in the beginning, then they also know that they can put their voices in the room later when it's time to have a conversation. You also choose a check-in question based on you know, the tone you're trying to set. As hosts and facilitators, you have the opportunity to set the tone for the conversation that's to come. And so the question that we're using today that you can see on the screen is a way to start a conversation and set tone with positivity with something that brings people joy. So that's a way to get people thinking in a different mindset. You know, we don't know what happened before people got there. You don't know what's going on outside of that conversation for that day for a person, but you can help set the tone and you can help uh, set mindsets for what's about to happen during your day. And so today's second question, what is one thing that brings you joy today? And so we're gonna go around the table here, starting with Ms. Mills. Um, and usually when you do a check-in question, particularly because we're talking about environment, however you are interpreting that question as hosts and facilitators, um, because we're talking about that, we're gonna ask just what neighborhood do you live in? So your name, what neighborhood do you live in? And then what is one thing that brings you joy today? Thanks, Erica. So this is Lila, I live in Beechwood. This morning I started my day with my six-year-old son at his kindergarten closing meeting and it brings me joy to sit with him and, and see all that he's learned. Well, this is Dawn and I'm in the Buckeye neighborhood in Cleveland. And one thing that brings me joy today was watching Serena Williams uh, advance to the next round at the French Open uh, oh, yeah. live. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hi again, Erica. I live in Mount Pleasant, and the thing that brings me joy today is I dropped off my daughter at Tri-C because she's taking summer classes on purpose, and she got out of the car with this huge trifold board that has everything about golfing that she did this year, and who knew that she was that into golfing, so that really brought me joy. 
Hi, this is Nicole. I live in Shaker Square, and something that brings me joy today is that I bought a new book yesterday, and I'm really happy thinking about reading it once it gets to me. <laughs> My name's Tony Vento. I live on the near west side on a block that in the last 10 years, some realtors have called Ohio City. And um, one thing that brings me joy today is um, it's already been a good day. I had a great coaching session with a PhD student, a part of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Initiative for creating uh, leaders for the coming decades for building a culture of health that's inclusive and social determinants and um, uh, mindful of undoing the isms that get in the way of building a culture of health. Awesome. Uh, and again, I'm Stephanie Thompson. I live in Shaker Heights. And um, the thing that brings me joy is always my daughter every morning um, fighting me because she only wants to wear this one shirt that has a dinosaur with a crown on it. <laughs> and I wash this shirt a couple times a week, and she only wants to wash that. And so today was a morning that she wanted to wear it, and it was clean. Yeah. And so <laughs> I didn't have to have a, a, a fight with a three year old this morning, and that brings me great joy. Culture of health for everyone. <laughs> um, so, and just another word about check ins that I think are really great for when it comes to common ground is they give you a, a, a moment to really share something about yourself. Um, that maybe is outside of the conversation you're going to have. It allows people to, have, to take a really quick snapshot of who you are as a person. Um, and that's really what Common Ground is about, is creating those connections. So it's a really integral part of Common Ground. That's why we started with it. Uh, before we even talked about what Common Ground is, because hopefully if you're attending this conversation training, you already have a, de a decent idea of what how that works. So, um, so thanks, Erica. What's Thank next? You. So what's next is actually talking about what is common ground. <laughs> oh, perfect. What a great segue. Um, so then I guess I'll jump in then. All right. And so for everyone um, watching, listening, uh, you have in your conversation guide that was sent out to you. So we're going to start on page one. Yeah. Um, so common ground is in its third year. This will be the third year that we've come together to create a, a region-wide day of community conversation. This has been an experiment for the Common Ground, um, for the Cleveland Foundation to see how we can use our position in the community at sort of a 35,000 feet above um, and sort of watching a lot of things that are happening in the community and bring people together using that, that big umbrella that, that we are lucky enough to have. The Cleveland Foundation works within um, Cuyahoga, uh, Lake, and Geauga counties. And within that three county footprint, we have a lot of different types of, of communities, um, lots of different priorities, lots of different focus areas. And the idea of Common Ground is to bring people together and learn and experience all of these different communities um, and have that opportunity to make connections within them to sort of come together around shared ideas, shared priorities, and create valuable conversations and connections. Because once you have those connections between people, um, things happen that maybe don't necessarily come from a, a formal agenda or a strategic plan. Um, people making connections create good work and better communities. And that's really what Common Ground is about. Um, and that's also why we brought the teams at Neighborhood Connections um, and Neighbor Up and IOB into the Common Ground footprint because they are folks who are doing this on the ground every day and they are our community's thought leaders on creating valuable connections that lead to good community work. So we're very lucky to have them. Um, each year Common Ground is built around a theme. We do this because as you'll, as you've seen if you've gone through our conversation guide, um, you can create sort of a structure for a conversation, but you really need something to unify them. So each year we choose a, a theme around which um, to build the conversations. This year's theme is based around my environment. 
which is in connection with sort of the recognition of the 50th anniversary of the Cuyahoga River fire, um, which is the anniversary of which is coming up on June 22nd. Um, we were inspired by this idea that the entire community is going to be coming together and celebrating and reflecting around this momentous event that changed our nation's physical and natural environments and also sort of our spiritual environments and our community environments and the way we think about how we steward natural spaces. But the word environment has a lot of different meanings. You don't necessarily have to be talking about your natural environment um, or climate change or, um, or waterways in order to have talk about impactful environments that all of us live in every day. So this year's theme is um, focused around looking back through it with a historical lens on where our environments have been, um, looking at where we are now and the work that has been done historically leading to um, sort of our current place in history, and then looking forward, kind of looking forward and seeing what more needs to be done, what more can be done, what more should be done, and therefore looking at potential through the lens of what's already happened. Um, we do this in order to sort of create a frame for our conversation, which um, Erica and Neighborhood Connections will, will chat about in a moment. But um, it's really to provide a structure to help all of you, our hosts and facilitators, think about um, the conversation you want to have on June 30th. So on June 30th, people will be coming to your places of business or your home or your uh, local park or wherever your community is coming together for your conversation. And on that day, they're going to have this conversation. Um, this training is really to help you figure out how to use the theme if you want to, because, because again, it's, it's all, this is meant to be flexible. It's a framework that exists to assist um, you in shaping the way this conversation can be built, but it's optional. Um, we have folks who create working conversations where they're collecting community feedback and they have very specific questions that they want to achieve and, and get answers for. Um, and that's perfectly fine. We will work with you to help shape that into common ground. But um, for those of you who are looking for sort of a structure to assist, to assist you as you sort of plan that framework of my environment was, my environment is, and my environment will be, um, is the framework in which we're building our conversation in our region. The next step is uh, Eric is going to take it away. Hi again, everyone. Um, so we're still on page one, and I'm just going to briefly talk about roles for common ground. Um, so there are roles for everyone to play. So every single person who shows up at an event is participating in one of these roles. You could be a host at common ground. So that means that you are choosing the place and the time. As a host, you are also the one who's deciding what the conversation topic is. You have absolutely already entered your information into an Eventbrite <laughs> invitation. <laughs> and I know you have, I already know it. Um, and you're also providing some sort of meal, snack, food, dessert, however you want to do that for the people who are going to show up for your conversation. Um, as a facilitator, that's another role, a facilitator is someone who is going to help move these conversations along and it's part of the team with the host. So let me say that one more time. Host and facilitator are a team, and your role as a facilitator, so I'm gonna go straight off the paper right now, and then I'm gonna talk some more about it. Um, you are a guide who makes sure all voices are welcomed, heard, and respected. The best facilitators talk little, but keep the group focused on one conversation. You work with the host to craft the best possible experience for participants, and you work with participants to find the best path toward connection. You guide the way and share the next steps. So hosts have an amazing, important role because they are holding that space and helping to create that space where these conversations can happen and choosing the direction that the conversations go in and providing the different elements that go into that. As a facilitator working in tandem with your host, you are really holding that space together. So that space is there 
for you to participate in, you are really the person who are, who's holding it together. You're really the glue for what's going to happen. You are guiding people through what could be an amazing, happy, happy conversation. It could be an emotional conversation. It depends on the subject and it depends on who shows up. You are the person, you're like shepherding people through anything that could happen there. So there might be amazing triumphs in this conversation. There might be some challenges in this conversation, but as a facilitator um, and as a facilitator, it's our job to make sure that everything stays on track and runs smoothly. It, we make it look easy <laughs> so that people feel more comfortable participating. As a facilitator, you make it easy for people to participate. You make it easy for people to feel heard, to feel like what they have to say matters, and to feel like they can move on to the next step and make connections with people there. As a facilitator, we're gonna talk more about your role later as we recap that later on in the guide, as you've probably already seen if you've gone through the guide or as you will see if you haven't. Um, in your role as a facilitator, sometimes conversations can get off track. You'll be the person to bring them back on track. Not because you're talking a lot. Like what I'm doing right now, this is for a webinar. I'm talking way too much as a facilitator because there has to be room for other people to talk. <laughs> so this is what you won't do right here. But as a facilitator, you'll be able to bring people back, not necessarily because you're talking a lot, but because you asked one question that brings everybody back to center. And so that's something that you're able to practice, that you're able to ask questions about as we go along. All right. And then the final role, which... Without this role, being a host or being a facilitator probably won't be that much fun. Participants, so everyone who's in that conversation is a participant in the conversation. When the participants show up, these are the people that we want to feel welcome. We want them to feel like everything that's happening is like for their benefit so that they can come to this conversation. They are making a choice to show up at each one of the spaces that they show up in. Like they have the ability to vote with their feet and go wherever it is that they wanna go and they are choosing to come to the conversation that you are hosting and facilitating. Um, so first thing you wanna acknowledge that and recognize that. So be sure to thank your participants and that's for hosts and for facilitators alike. Thank your participants. Um, and so these are people who are curious. They looked on Eventbrite or they heard somebody talking about an event and they were like, I really wanna to go to that one. These are people who have probably scheduled their day and said, I'm going to a conversation at nine, I'm going to a conversation at 12, I'm going to one at three. Um, they might be full if you have a dinner conversation, so just know that. But there are different people coming from different places and participants are the key to everything that's going to happen that day because if you don't have participants, you don't have a conversation. So just keep that in mind. But every single person who shows up and every single person at the table has a role to play during that day. All right, any questions about the roles? All right, then I will go. All right, so the next part we're gonna move on to, so that's really the next page in your handout, is just really talking about preparing for your conversation. And the ways that you prepare, some of it goes along with your role and how you prepare for your conversation. Um, but if you're planning on hosting or facilitating, again, register on Eventbrite <laughs> so that you can have your event listed. And that way people can sign up and it's easy for them to find you because it's all in one place. Um, if you want to have facilitators, that is something that you need to decide as a host. Uh, if you are having a small private conversation, and some people are, if you are having a conversation where you just expect a few people to show up because you really wanna have a targeted intentional conversation about something specific, it may be okay to not have a facilitator. You might be able to facilitate it yourself as a host and then you play two roles and the people you are inviting are the participants that you're inviting. It's okay to do that because you know exactly what you wanna get out of the conversation, you know the people who are showing up if it's a small private group, and you know how you want it to go. And you, you've probably chosen the people, you've listed it as a closed invitation just so the people have information, but so that they know like, this is a closed invitation, but these are the people who are coming. And that's fine. If you know that you're about to bring up a subject that might, that there's no way that you can tackle it all by yourself. Uh, what I would suggest is for about every six to eight participants, you have a facilitator. If you are expecting a really large group, if you're from an organization, uh, one thing that we would suggest, which came from uh, working with the Common Ground Committee, is send your own facilitators. If you know that there are people in your organization who are really keyed into what you wanna talk about, who already have all the background about your organization, that's something that you can choose. It's okay to, to set the stage like that. Facilitation and hosting is all about planning and preparation. 
So it's okay to not leave that to chance and to request specific facilitators and send them to the training or have them come along with you. Uh, make sure that they log into the webinar if they weren't able to, if they aren't able to come to one of the in-person trainings. That also works. So remember, if it's more casual and super small, you may be able to handle it or you may be able to trust the people at your table have enough conversation skills that they can do it themselves. If it's a larger group, or if you're wondering, if you don't know who's gonna show up, if you're, you've got an open invitation and you have no idea how many people are gonna show up, make sure you have at least minimum two facilitators ready to go. Um, and we'll talk later about how we can follow up with that and help you get facilitators if you don't already have facilitators in mind. All right, so we're gonna go into the elements of a common ground conversation that's starting on page, oh, that's on page three and four of your conversation guide. And I'm just gonna ask Stephanie to show some of the things that will be literally setting the table for your common ground conversations. Yes. Okay, so when we are working on set, creating a welcoming environment for our guests, all hosts will receive a very well, not a very extensive, but a host kit that allows you to sort of set that table ahead of time. So when people walk in, they can see that this is a special event. It's not just a meal and a conversation. It's also a meal and conversation with swag. <laughs> <laughs> um, but swag with a purpose. So the first things that we, um, that we share with everyone are some things to literally set the table. Um, one of those elements are our table conversation stickers. Apologies, I pull this up. Um, these will come in your host kit. They look like this. These are ultra removable stickers. They come off, the backings come off, and you can stick them anywhere and they will come right off. Trust me, I have a three year old. I know all about this. So they can stick right on a table, on the wall, on a window, however you'd like to use them. Um, you can write on them, they come blank, so you can write on them with a Sharpie. Um, for, for ours today, I wrote our question prompts, my conversation, my environment was, is, and will be. Um, those can be set up on the table beforehand or however you'd like to use them. Another important piece that you will receive um, that we'll dig into a little bit more, more deeply is our civility rules, cards, and buttons. So. Our civility rules, are you going to dig a little bit deeper into that? Okay, so I will just share with you what they are and then Erica will cover um, what they are in detail. But each participant will receive a civility rules card. This outlines our sort of shared principles for civil civic conversation, which help people enter into the conversation um, with a little bit more um, awareness about the role they want to play in that particular conversation. Um, you receive a little card like this that has every uh, civility rule on it, and then each person is asked to choose a button. And if you're familiar with Common Ground or you've been to one before, I think it's safe to say that the buttons are probably a bit of the biggest hit <laughs> at Common Ground conversations. Um, they, the civility rules say things like, uh, I will speak from my own experience, I will listen to understand, and we ask each person to choose one of these buttons and put it on before the conversation begins. In addition, you'll also receive um, some notebooks so people can take notes, and, um, and then some paper collateral that is shared at the end of the event. So those are the materials you receive ahead of time. There's also yard signage and a few other things. All of those pieces you will pick up, um, well, this group will need to pick them up off-site, and we will share with you how to do that um, a little bit closer to Common Ground Day. Um, but one place where you will be able to pick them up is at our host and facilitator meet and greet, which is on the evening of June 27th at the Midtown Tech Hive. Um, host kits will be available there for pickup. If you aren't able to pick up on that day, um, you'll just need to reach out to us and we'll, we'll figure out a better way to do that. Um, most hosts will be picking up their kits at their individual conversation trainings when they attend in person. Okay. All right. Thank you. So we're gonna move into the civility rules because this is really important for having a conversation. These conversations are bringing, like literally bringing people in from everywhere to participate together for one day, uh, for a couple of hours over a meal. 
as I stated before, when I was talking about the roles, you don't know who's going to show up to your conversation if you are having an open conversation where people can sign themselves up. So you can have people coming from totally different neighborhoods, totally different backgrounds, totally different experiences. The civility rules and the smaller civility pledge are a way to set the tone, kind of like a check-in. So like you have a check-in to like prime the room and to get everybody's voice in there. And then the civility pledge and the civility room rules are a way for everyone to like frame how they're gonna participate in this conversation. So it's really setting up your agreements. So a lot of times people will, you know, when we do facilitation in person, you have like room rules or you have agreements that people are going to go with, or you have group norms, sometimes people call them. Um, whatever language you use, that's what these civility rules are, is to set the tone for the conversation and the expectations. As facilitators and as hosts, but especially as facilitators, part of your role is from the beginning to set expectations of how the day is going to go. There are a lot of things that you can't control, but what you can manage, that's what you completely accept responsibility for managing. And one of those things is making sure that people are aware of how we're going to behave together while we're here. And so with the Civility Rules Pledge, um, it is very simply on page three, we are here to explore ideas, we are here to learn from others, we are here to connect, not, not to conflict with each other. So it's a discussion, it's not a debate. There will be things that people don't agree on. It's fine to not agree with people. What's not okay to do is to allow the conversation to go in an abusive direction or in a direction where people are just talking to be, you know, just to debate or just to be um, in disagreement with other people. Um, so when you're setting that tone, that's what these are for. And that's also why you're asking people to choose a button themselves. And there are a lot of people, let's go ahead and give a warning now. There are a lot of people who want every button, but that's after the conversation. <laughs> for the purposes of beginning the conversation, you ask people to choose one button for what they want to focus on and what they're going to hold while they're in that space in that particular conversation. Um, so when they are participating in this, there are certain things that they want to participate in that you want to get them to participate in. You want them to talk about being forward looking. So yes, we are looking back at what environment was. We are looking at the present, where we are right now. We are looking at the future. But the entire idea, like since that's the last question, is what will be and uh, what it can be. We are really being intentional and targeting using language that is so a word we use all the time in neighborhood connections is aspirational. So we are targeting like using that kind of language. So if we are forward focused and we are looking at the civility rules, that's a way to be really intentional and really aspirational about how this conversation is going to go. So even if people disagree, even if there are points that come up that are sore spots for other people, it's okay because we can figure out how to deal with it together in that conversation. And you as a facilitator can also figure out how to manage any tension that comes up and keep the conversation flowing smoothly. So, I'd like some help with the civility rules if yes. people would like to participate because sure. I know like it's time to stop hearing just my voice because you're going to hear it some more. <laughs> All right, so I will kick it off and then other people, like there are a whole five more. Uh, value all voices. Make sure there's room for the quietest among us to be heard in the conversation. This is also very easily known as step up, and step back, and share the air. Everyone who is participating in this conversation has something to contribute. They may not be comfortable contributing yet, but they have something to contribute. And as always, as my colleague Coney says, it's by invitation, not demand. People, of course, have the option to pass or to participate as much or as little as they want to. But our jobs as facilitators is to make room for them to be able to if they want to. Um, so part of what you're going to set the tone for in these conversations is Everyone's voice has value. Everything that someone needs to say can be a contribution to this conversation. So you can remind people, if you are normally a talker, <laughs> I'm gonna ask that you give yourself a pause between contributions. Not saying that that person can't, cont can't contribute multiple times, but just if you've already put your voice into this conversation once, if you could give a pause to allow someone else to speak again before you, before you contribute again. That's okay to ask people. We're gonna ask people to share the air. If you are normally quiet and it takes you a while to process, I am one of those people. If it takes you time to process before you have a response, it's okay to take that time to process and then put that response out. Sometimes people need to hear that that's okay, especially if they're at a table with really like 
people who can talk and think while they're talking. Some people need a moment to process. And as a facilitator, when you state that plainly, that they have the opportunity to process first before contributing, a lot of times people are like, oh, thank you, because they would have never asked for that opportunity to process before participating. So remember that. All right, who'd like to go next? I'll go. Um, I will pick the one that I usually um, try to pick, which is uh, trying to look forward. I think t sometimes folks have a tendency to think it's like, well, this is the way I've always done it, or this is the way things have always been. Sort of, this is this is this is what I feel comfortable with. Mm -hmm. And so I try to really um, sort of look the pick look forward because it's focus on possibility on how to start and who can help you. Um, help you start. So that's my personal favorite. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'll go next. So listen to understand. Strive to understand each other even across differing points of view. I think that sometimes when people are engaged in a conversation, they listen to people to provide a rebuttal to what mm -hmm. they said. But at Common Ground, we strive to encourage people to list, actually listen and hear what people are saying. My favorite is speak from experience. Um, personal observations instead of generalizations. And that's something I think I learned um, from Neighbor Up Gatherings years ago and use personally, like in my personal conversations with people, because I think it's easy for us to go to generalizations. And when we take a minute, we say, oh, wait, let me speak from my own experience. It's much easier to understand and much more truthful. Question kindly. I'm gonna take that one, Tony. I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, and I'm gonna I'm gonna steal the Tonyism as well. Um, question kindly. Uh, it's it's about like starting with I wonder questions, stepping into wonder versus like stepping in to question somebody about like validity or asking them to prove their point of view. Um, it is very very um, mindful to use the I wonder why. I'm having a reaction this way and to question from that point of view. Well, that leaves us with respect for everyone, which I think embodies these other pieces. But as it says, we all want what's best for our community. And even if we disagree, we strive not to be disagreeable. So um, coming from this intention, I think creates the container that invites us to know that we as persons are well. We're not just ideas, we're not reactions, we're not just histories, we're not just traumas, we're persons. Staying in the person-centered mode for this, I think um, as a facilitator, I know, and as a participant, both, that is the through line that it up. This is a person. Sometimes I have to tell myself, this is somebody's child. This is somebody worthy of respect. And especially if I'm feeling drawn the opposite way, that's when I really need to reconnect to that. Thank you. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that's about using the civility rules in your conversations and use and how you can use a civility button. So when you ask people to choose one, uh, one of the things that you can ask people as they're choosing them, so this can also go into the next thing. So on page four, we're moving into the next part. So you set the tone. You've set the room, you've literally set the table, you, the hosts and facilitators are ready to go. And the first thing that you start off, which is the first thing we started off with, is a check-in. And so part of your check-in can be, you can use the same question we use, what brings you joy? There are different examples in your packet. So something that's on there is also like, why is being here today important to you? Uh, what is your favorite Northeast Ohio environment? You can also ask people as a check-in question, you can say, you can say your name, you can say where you live, and then you can, I'm gonna ask you, why do you choose the button that you chose? You can ask people why they chose the button. That's a good check-in question because I know that when I choose buttons, I've chosen a few, all six, okay, fine. <laughs> there are very specific reasons, depending on the conversation, why I've chosen that particular button. Like if I know that I'm, this conversation, I know, like I came here because I'm really interested in what other people have to say, but I'm also kind of fired up about it, whether that's good or bad. 
then I probably want to remember, you know, to value all voices. Like, I probably want to remember to question kindly if I think that part of this conversation might put me in a not so great mood. Like, if I think something's going to, like, get triggered for me, like, personally, depending on what part of my environment we're talking about. So I'm probably going to put on the question kindly button, and I'm more than happy to share. Like, I'm wearing the question kindly button because I don't know where this conversation is going to go, and I need to remember to wonder why instead of, well, you said this, and I'm upset. So, and also speaking from experience, that I'm gonna choose that one probably too. So I probably wear three. <laughs> Have people choose one. Okay. <laughs> I mean, does that, it, for those who are familiar with this kind of language, it's a way of inviting people to set their intention, inviting them more actively into the process of co-creating the space by choosing that button. Why, as you said, you said. And I love to choose the word again. So a word you're gonna hear a lot and a word that you should probably think about writing your notes in whole. You can put it in one of the stickers on the table. It's about being intentional. You can put intentional, intention, intentionality, however you want to phrase it. But these conversations are really about, you know, you are on purpose doing this. Um, part of what you can do is your check-in, and thank you for reminding me of that, check-in with as hosts and facilitators, um, even before, Participants are there at the table where you're doing your official check-in for the conversation. As hosts and facilitators together, you can check in with each other. Uh, so the slang we tend to use is a huddle, where we get together and talk, set our intentions for what's going to happen that day. You can do that as hosts and facilitators together. I would strongly suggest it, and I'm sure everybody at this table would strongly suggest that you do that. <laughs> set your intentions for the day. How do you want participants to feel while they're there? when they leave, uh, when they're walking in the door, so that you already have that in place and so that you keep that at front of mind. So that that's something that you can always go back to. So that's why I suggested also you can write it in the middle of one of your stickers that's on the table. So you know, like, what's my intention here? What's, I'm being very intentional about how I'm hosting this. I'm being very intentional about how I'm facilitating this. And what is my actual intention? Uh, so remember that. All right, so now we can go into the actual conversation. All right, ready? <laughs> okay. So when you go into your actual conversations, you know that you have the conversation prompt. So you have the idea of what your conversation is as a host, you have your actual prompt. My environment was, is, and will be. Past, present, future. One of the ways that we worked on this last year with rounds of conversation it, and which is a really easy way to participate in conversation and requires, um, this is what allows you to be the type of facilitator who doesn't have to talk as much. There you go. Is that you give people instructions on rounds of conversations. So it can be one round where people are timed and they talk about environment was. They, you can do a round where people are timed and they talk about what it is. And then you do another timed round where they talk about what it will be. This works really well because you've probably given a time frame to your conversation and people are probably participating in more than one conversation for that day. So it keeps you within your time frame because you timed out each section of the conversation. And it also allows you to you know, maintain the integrity of the space. Sometimes if, if there's a lull in a conversation, it can take away from the integrity of the space because people have been given too much time to talk about it or if people haven't been given enough time to talk about it, um, but they weren't aware of how much time they had, sometimes if people feel cut short, then they feel like they weren't heard, or they feel like they aren't being listened to, or they don't feel like we're valuing all voices. So you wanna be very clear about your times at each table, if you have multiple tables, you wanna be clear about the times for each round of conversation. So that's just a suggestion for a model, which helps with facilitation and helps with you as a host. Um, if you have other ideas about you know, how to frame that, feel free to type them in the chat uh, so that other people can see them. And if you have other ideas about, even you can go back to like the check-in, if you have other ideas about check-in questions or other ways you'd like to do the check-in, I would also suggest that you type them in the chat so that other people can see them. Um, so I don't know what everybody's conversation is about. I don't know if everyone's chosen a conversation topic yet, but some of the things that you can think about around the theme, um, as far as like if you haven't come up with a conversation yet to get some of your creative things flowing, uh, you can think about natural spaces, you can think about built environments, you can think about resources. 
So in one of our committee meetings, uh, one of the conversations that happened was that people were talking about the political environment. And they were talking about what it was like growing up for them, what it is like for them now, and what they want it to be in the future. People were talking about their work environments and you know what it was like when they first got there, what it is now, and what things have changed, and what they want it to be in the future. So environment like comes in different ways for everyone, and there are going to be some amazing and creative conversations that are happening that day. And I can't show up at every single one, but I will get really close to showing up <laughs> to as many as possible. And so that's the end of that on page four. <laughs> Even right. page numbers. Right, right. <laughs> really good at right. that. <laughs> All right, does anybody else here want to contribute anything to that part about the conversation? All right. Uh, one other thing that I do want to just pop in here is as hosts and facilitators, when you're setting your intention and when you as a host have decided what it is that you want to get out of the day, and when you have communicated that with your facilitator, one thing that you want to be mindful of is that a way to make sure that you get what you want out of the conversation is if you need to ask someone to write those things down for you. So if you have multiple tables, it's okay to ask a participant because they can say yes or no. It's okay to ask a participant if they will record some information from you for you just to find out what happened at that table. So you can't be in every single space at a time at the same time. So if you have three or four tables going, you can ask participants at each table, even if they write it down in the stickers that are on the table, or if you provide paper for them to write it down on the table. But as a host and with and in in as a team with your facilitators, facilitator or facilitators, you will be able to capture the things that you want to capture from the conversation so that you can move forward with that information. If you want to make sure that you have people's information because you're really excited about who showed up and you'd love to contact them again, ask people permission to capture their information and you can have a sign-in sheet. So there are different ways that you can participate in this and different tools that you can use. Um, you're not held to, like this is a great guide and I would suggest you absolutely use every single page in this guide. Um, but you can also add your own things to personalize your conversation. And we encourage that. I think just, I want to put a couple, couple um, notes on this, is that if you do collect information from your participants, and if you are having them, um, if you're taking detailed notes, or if you've structured your conversation so that it is a working conversation where you're collecting community feedback, um, you don't have to share that information with the Clayton Foundation. Um, we don't require... Um, you to take notes from your conversation. We don't require anything like that. So anything that you collect from your participants is yours to keep. Um, and so a lot of organizations are using common ground conversations as a way to um, to sort of achieve, you know, get community feedback or or share what maybe some plans that they're doing and, and get um, get the their stakeholders' thoughts on that. So so that's something I wanted to share. The other piece is. Um, and I'm sure we'll share about this a little bit more, but you want to leave people at the end of your conversation sort of wanting more. Uh, you don't want them, like if they, everybody's like, oh, okay, thanks, that's over. <laughs> you don't want that. You want, you want people to have to be pried away. You want them to um, want to keep talking. In the first two years, um, my favorite result that we received back from surveys that we give at the at the end of Common Ground, which we'll talk about in a little bit, um, was that about the first year it was almost half, the, and then last year it was about 40% of people who participated and filled out the survey exchanged contact information with someone they met at a Common Ground conversation. That shows us that when people are sitting down for these conversations, you know, they're meeting perfect strangers, but then wanting to continue that connection, and that is where that's really, I think, the power of, the, of this. And so you want people to make those next steps. And so as a host or as a facilitator, you want to make sure that that can happen. Thanks, Erica. Thank you. All right, and just the last thing that's on that page is just about, this is really just a walkthrough in the guide, and then we're gonna go into a little bit more detail. But closing and sharing. So much like you set the stage with a check-in, and you set the table, and you created the space that you wanted to have, or your participants who show up. Um, it's also really, really good practice to close it out in a way where people are wanting more, but that it's clear that it's the end. Um, so you can do that in a number of ways. So right in here it says, to encourage guests to continue the conversation, 
ask guests to consider the experience they just had and then share with the group what they'll be taking with them from the conversation. So much like a check-in, this is a check-out. So it kind of bookends the conversation. You set the tone, you set the stage for what's going to happen. You do what you said you were going to do and have a conversation. And then you check out by, you know, you close the curtain on what happened there today. But you also leave that space open as part of the checkout for people to say what they got out of it, but also to be able to say, but I wanna get more, or but I wanna talk to another person. And so when you ask people, what are they taking away from today? It could be, you know, I'm taking away that I learned this, this, and this, or I'm taking away that I wanna talk to Lila, like way more once we leave here. Um, so that could be the thing that they're taking away. It could be taking away that I met someone who I probably would have never met had I not shown up for this conversation. And so those are great things to capture during the course of your day. Another thing that you can also ask, oh, quick question. Photo releases, will they need those in yes. the kits? So um, what we provide to hosts as a part of the kits is a sign that you can share at your event that um, sort of lets people know that there will be photography possibly um, taken of that event and that people should let the host know if they don't want their photo taken. Um, we don't do individual releases because last year we had 5,000 people participate. And <laughs> I wouldn't even know where to send 5,000 photo releases. So instead we provide a sign that um, we ask hosts to display to let people know um, that there are photos and that to, if you would rather not, make sure you let somebody know. And, and that's a good way to also capture what happened during the day. So even if you can't capture in words necessarily what happened during the day, capturing photos of what happened during your conversation is a good way to be able to say like, this is who showed up and this is what we did. All right, so also part of the closing out and the sharing part. So when you do your checkout, you can ask specific questions depending on, again, what you intended to get out of the conversation as a host and what you've asked your facilitator to do uh, to help you achieve that goal. You can ask, check out questions that you've already planned. Something might come up during the course of conversation where you wanna, where people you're like, well, how many people wanna get together again? You could ask that. This is also the time for giving, as a facilitator and a host, for giving out, you know, you have your swag on the table. This is also a time for pointing out ways that people can follow up and ways that people can take that next step after their conversation. So there will also be information about what's coming up through, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, coming up through Neighborhood Connections and the Neighborhood Network, also what's coming through from IOB after Common Ground. So you'll be having your, you know, hashtag CG2019 conversations, and you'll have that information, and then there will also be, you know, after Common Ground things that come up. And so this will be the opportunity for your facilitator and for you as a host to introduce these items and to introduce what's happening in a calendar to your guests and to make sure that each person has it and has the ability to access what they want to access. All right, so we'll move on to page five and six. And what this is, is a sample agenda and a way for you to create how you want your day to go. So this goes back to setting your intentions as hosts and facilitators. This is a way that you can map it out. So you can talk about what you're going to do. You can plan it out on paper and you can go by what you planned out as part of your agenda. It is also something that you can post. So if you have like flip chart paper and you wanna post it so that the people who are participating in your conversation know exactly what's going to happen that day, people do like that. People appreciate it. Participants appreciate it all the time. As a facilitator, I'm sure you appreciate that also. As a host, you'll appreciate how much easier it makes your day for setting up. People want to know what you're going to do. They wanna be there while you do it. And then they want to know what you did. So if you set up your agenda in a way where those three things happen, then that'll make for a great and successful conversation day. And so you, it has listed on here specifically how to follow the uh, set timing. You can adjust your time. So this is basically saying that this is the timing for a two-ish hour conversation. It might be three hours, depending on how long you scheduled your time for. You can adjust your times accordingly. These are suggestions for how you do it, but it does go over everything from setting the table to your check-ins and icebreakers, to how you set up your meal, to how you have your conversation, and the moments of reflection, which is also where you can capture what happened in people's conversations, and then what's next.
Yeah, so you've got um, the actual sort of agenda on one side that sort of gives you the sketch and then you have a blank one which I'm showing on the screen right now where you can sort of fill in and use this um, to sketch out your different, your different pieces. Um, so this is why I mentioned earlier on that we provide a frame and then you can customize it to whatever your group's needs are. Which is a really good thing. So that's also something that you can even say in your conversation. So something that a lot of us at this table are fond of saying <laughs> is there's structure, but no agenda. So I'm not choosing what people say in my conversation, but I am providing the structure so that they can participate in a way that's meaningful for them. All right, if there are, I'm gonna ask if there are questions. I'm not gonna assume that there are none. <laughs> are there any questions so far? Could you speak a little bit more about the reflection portion? Absolutely. Especially for introverts. <laughs> <laughs> yes, let's take a moment and just talk about our introverts. Let's talk about our introverts and how we provide them space. Yes. And yes. the way it also benefits the extroverts. We yes. Realize that happens. So clearly I'm at a table with a couple of extroverts. <laughs> And as their introvert colleague slash friend, um, the time to reflect, you can even, it's as part of how you set your own agenda, instead of it being like a, okay, we're gonna reflect here, it can be something where your facilitator specifically says, this is a time for reflection, and you give people time to do it silently. Extroverts, a lot of times, reflect out loud because all the thoughts are popping all the time and they've got the words for them as they're reflecting on them. And they are like working through it and processing it as they're talking. For the people who are a little bit quieter and need some more time to process, give them some time. So it's okay, people are cleaning up from their meals, people are moving around, people have met other people. Um, the people who are really comfortable and good with not having quiet time to reflect will do what they need to do. You can give them some instruction and they will do what they need to do. They will throw away their place. They will pick up something off the table. Um, the people who need the time, you can set a timer. You can just give them an idea. You can have, I love sound effects. So <laughs> you can do like a gentle chime. You can do a little shaker egg. You can do small things to let people know that this is the time we're gonna start our reflecting time. And this is the time we're gonna end our reflecting time. And it's okay to give people a decent amount of time. Like if you know that you're not running over, you can give people three to five minutes to be able to reflect. They might be the kind of people who need to write it down. So give people the opportunity to do that so that you can really get what you need out of this conversation and so that all your participants can really get what they need before they leave. Um, because really the last thing that you want to have happen is the, the walking away from the conversation conversation. Uh, we tend to call that parking lot conversations when you facilitate gatherings and meetings where people don't feel like they got to do a process what they needed to right there, so then it continues somewhere else, but not necessarily in a productive way. So it's not necessarily people walking away and saying, I wanna to talk to you some more. Those are great parking lot conversations. It's people walking away and say, well, they could have done this differently. I wish I'd had more time to think about what I wanted to say before we ended. And so to, you can't control all of it, but you can help facilitate the process for people to be able to share what they need to share before they leave. All right, was that good? Yes, All thank, right. you. <laughs> thank you. But how wonderful that extroverts have learned how to really appreciate what introverts need. Yeah. Thank you. I wanna just add a, a little adage that helps me remember, because sometimes when I'm at that moment of about to invite reflection, I sometimes have a little pause like, oh, I really can invite people to do this because in the course of like a like a dinner party we don't usually do that right and a dinner party is sort of the the template of this so i'm conscious that when it comes to that time of reflection that's a little break from the sort of inherent paradigm of sharing a meal like that what helps me is to remember this machines when we press pause stop but humans when we press pause get created and that helps me to be brave in inviting people to be creative about what's just happened so that they can be ready to take from it what they need. So humans get creative when we press pause. And so we're giving a gift. It's like that little uh, palate cleanser, you know, in, in the meal, you know, that just like takes a little moment and makes room for the next flavors to emerge.
and feel free to take any tidbit that you heard here today <laughs> and use it. Like so, sometimes I even say that <laughs> you know, when I'm transitioning into reflection. Machines, when we press pause, stop, but we're humans. And when we press pause, we get creative. So let's take a minute to get creative. So awesome facilitation tip for you facilitators listening. Um, that could be something that you could say to lead into that moment of reflection before you completely close out with the checkout. All right. I don't see questions, so I'm going to go on to page seven and eight to finish our walkthrough. In case you haven't figured it out by now, facilitators, <laughs> your role is so important to how these conversations are shaped and how they move forward and how they end and what comes out of them. And it's not, it's not to put any additional pressure on you. It's really to understand like just really how important your role is. So things get repeated a lot and that's why you have like even the breakout blocks, like you've already seen this about how the conversation flows, but really this is really about your role in each part of the conversation and in each part of how the day goes. So the first part with setting the table. So I stated this earlier, and I can't stress this enough. Arrive early, arrive early, arrive early. Arrive early. Arrive early. Even as the facilitator? <laughs> yes. As the host? Especially. It, especially yeah. as the facilitator. <laughs> yeah, definitely facilitators and hosts, you need to become like one. Yes, yes. you are a team. You are and a this, team. This is why it's so important as a host to really determine your facilitation needs. So that's why I stated that in the beginning about how important that is. Know your facilitation needs. If it really is something where, you know, you've got somebody who can facilitate for you, have them attend the training. You already have a relationship with them, have them do that for you. If you're part of an organization that needs facilitators, send people from your organization. They already know the backstory. They already know what your expectations are. They already know how you intend to hold space. They're probably familiar with the surroundings already. They can give, all the, the housekeeping and directions to people without having to ask a bunch of questions. Um, but it's really important to develop a plan. And we'll provide an opportunity if you don't already have facilitators uh, ready to go or who you've already sent through training, there'll be an opportunity during the host and facilitator meet and greet for you to connect with somebody. And that's still happening days before the event. So you have time to check in with each other. You have time to exchange information and to develop your plan. Um, because you're there early, facilitator, because you already have a plan with your host, because I am holding that right now and I'm gonna keep holding that for you, <laughs> you have the opportunity to enjoy getting to know new people. So you don't have to wait until the check-in. Because you're there early, you're there when the first participant arrives. You get to greet people. Part of being a facilitator along with the host is you're part of the hosting team. So you greet people when they come in, because that also helps to set the tone. Before we even get to a check-in, before we even get to sitting down at a table, introduce yourself. Um, you're gonna introduce yourself to the entire group, but it's okay to already see who's going where. This is also a great time because you are there early and you've already developed a plan with your host to figure out how you're going to seat people. It's okay to ask people to sit at a table with someone they don't know. Now there are some people who are coming together and they're gonna to sit together no matter what. It's okay to ask them like, yes, that's awesome that you two are gonna sit here at this table together but could you please make sure that there's space at your table for people you don't know? Um, if it's a private conversation, of course, you know, people tend to already know each other, and so that's not necessarily the same. Um, you can do creative things to get people to sit at different spaces. You can do it with like stickers on a name tag or different color name tags. There are different ways that you can do it where it's not like you go sit there and you go sit there, but you're just guiding people. Like if I have a, a red circle on my name tag and there is a table with a red circle on it, I know that that's the table I'm gonna sit at and the people who I'm gonna participate in this conversation with also have red circles. That way it's random and it doesn't look like, you know, you're forcing people to talk to other people. That's completely random and they are coming to the conversation and they didn't know who they were gonna be talking to anyway when they chose that conversation. Um, next, your role for the check-in. Have fun. A question like what brings you joy is fun because you don't know what you're going to get. I would have never known that, well, having had some small people a very long time ago, <laughs> I know how they can get about their clothes, but I 
probably don't, I probably don't remember even how much joy that brought me <laughs> to know that like the thing you want right now is clean. I don't know how to fight you right now. <laughs> like, it brings me much joy. Like that brings me so much joy first thing in the morning. So to know that about people and to find those things out, you get to have fun. You also get to share something about yourself. Um, one of my first experiences with, oh, that's what being a facilitator means was having someone stop me mid-sentence and say, why am I listening to you? You don't even know like what goes on in my life. And what it was was that the people in the group, I had never said anything about myself personally. I was just, you know, Eric Brown facilitator. And I never said anything personal. I never shared anything. And I was in a space where people were sharing all their personal stuff with me all the time. And they had no idea that why I wanted to do that job was because I could completely relate to every part of their experience. And so having never shared that information, it kept me here as a facilitator with the rest of the group there. And as a facilitator, that's not what you're doing. That's what you do if you're a lecturer. That's what you do if you're a presenter. That's what you do when you stand up above people and behind things. As a facilitator, you are there to help make this conversation easier. You are there to make sure people are participating. You are there to, you know, really facilitate <laughs> what's going on. You make it easy for people. It's not for you to be apart from them completely. Like you're not sitting down at every table and participating in the conversation, but you're really helping things move the way they need to move. It's okay to share a personal thing about yourself when you do the check-in. All right, holding the conversation. Your primary role is to guide the conversation. You may have some amazing ideas. I know I do. I always have amazing ideas about every conversation that I've ever facilitated. <laughs> However, that's not the time or place for me to do that. I go have a conversation with someone else. Like I know other facilitators will just call them. <laughs> <laughs> so you're holding the space for the conversation. And this is whatever the format is that you've come up with because you're a team and you've planned it with your host. You understand your host's goals and you know how this is supposed to go. So you are holding the space for that conversation. Your host has created this space. You are holding it together. And you are ensuring the integrity of that space for the duration of the conversation. Yes, it is a heavy load. Um, yes, it is a big lift as a facilitator, but here's the thing. If you are signing up to be a facilitator in these conversations, you absolutely know that you can do this. Mm -hmm. And there's enough support and enough information where if at any time you're like, well, hold up, you can just contact us. <laughs> um, then we're going to go on to number four. Oh, can I go ahead in real quick? I just want to say one more thing about, um, you know, we want... Like if you're, you're, you and your host, if you're a facilitator and you and your host are on the same page on what the goals are for this conversation, um, that's where you know, the, the relaxation part should come. Because if you know that your host wants hard feedback, they want to hear, they want notes, they want to know exactly what people are going through, are, are having, you know, what their thoughts are. Or if you're having a challenging conversation, like say somebody decides they do want to have that past, present, future political conversation. Those facilitators, you already know what you're getting into because you know the conversation that you're being a part of. You've talked to your host. Um, so that's why we said at the beginning, you and your host are a team. You know, you understand what their goals are for hosting this conversation. Um, and your, your role as a facilitator is really to help them achieve that achieve that. Now, not everybody's going to have a hard conversation. Some folks are just like, let's have some pizza and talk about um, how much we love this space we're meeting in. And that's great too. And um, so in that case, your role as a facilitator may be a little bit lighter, but, um, but you know what that is going in. So that's why it's important that you and your hosts are a team. Yes. Just absolutely. to reiterate again, again. <laughs> um, the other thing I want to say real quick about holding space for conversation, like just to give an example from a conversation that happened last year, which is why it makes it super important to be part of a team with your host is we did have one facilitator who went through the in-person training was already a good facilitator and showed up at the space and the other facilitators who were in the space because it was such a large conversation worked for the organization a board member came in and kind of took over a table so no one else who was a facilitator in that space felt comfortable being able to say, 
hey, we want to hold the integrity of this space and keep that going. Could you please not do this side slideshow presentation with this table of people who are here for the Common Ground conversation? That's real. They brought a slideshow. <laughs> yeah, that's so real. <laughs> Luckily, there was a facilitator there who was a trained facilitator who did not work for the organization, who doesn't have any connection to this board member. Ooh, that's right, Lawrence. <laughs> <laughs> to this person, hi, thank you so much. So this is the way the day is actually going to go. And this group of people actually already have a table facilitator. But it would be great if you wanted to share that after the conversation. Who's creating a scene after that? <laughs> like, they invited the person to still share the slideshow. Like, I know this is important to you. This just isn't the time or place for it. Where everyone else in the space, because they kind of have to answer to that person, they weren't able to do that. Um, so no, things like that may come up, but it's a, but as a facilitator, so it's not your job to, you know, police people, but you are holding the space and you are maintaining the integrity of that space for the duration of the event. And maintaining the integrity of the space just means reminding people of why you're there and how they can participate in ways that work for everyone. And see, you say it in such a nice voice, it's okay. Exactly. I, I think that is so key. That is at the heart of the facilitator role is if and when the, the container, the process that's been established gets violated, if not broken, it's up to you as the facilitator to reestablish those conditions, to invite the reestablishing of those conditions. It might be as simple. There's been times that I just had to say, hmm, Let's go back and remember the button that each of us chose. Just take a moment, 10 seconds, a little reset, and invite ourselves back into the conversation. Mm -hmm. Or it might be something that's a more structural kind of intervention. <laughs> like, oh, the purpose today is you never cause problems by restating the purpose and um, holding up what's already been good um, in light of that purpose. Just like a brief, you know, 10 seconds of like, oh, our purpose here is, and we've already been doing A and B, just kind of implicitly resets the template of this is the stream we're moving in. Mm -hmm. And then if you have to, restating, and this other piece could happen after. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I invite you to say that. <laughs> but you are the one that is implicitly been given the trust to create this kind of environment. Mm -hmm. I like how you both used the idea of reminders. Yes. So these are just reminders. Yeah. Let's remember why we're here. That's kind of easy to remember if you haven't facilitated before. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's a remembering, literally, but like. I'm a geek on words. <laughs> Remembering literally means putting the members back together. So when you ask, when you pause as a facilitator and just ask people to remember why you're here, you're reconnecting, literally, and then you can move on. See, and that's awesome because Common Ground is about connection. And it's also <laughs> very helpful at the beginning when you're doing the civility rules to make sure that everyone in the space has agreement around those civility rules. So when you are holding someone accountable to them, it's it's a reminder. It's it's that that pull back to, hey, we all agreed to act in this certain kind of way. And we want to make sure that we hold up that integrity. Excellent. Thank you. All right. So your the fourth part of your role as a facilitator is the way you close the conversation. This is how you help the group consider the next steps. And this is also where you discuss the action calendar and the survey. So we will talk about those shortly. Um, but as you're closing out that conversation, it really does. If your host's intention was to have a fun conversation over pizza and have people in the space who are having a good time, then that's okay. That's enough because that's what your host wanted and that's the plan that you came up with with your host. If what your host wanted was to figure out who's about to join forces with them to take over the world, <laughs> then that's the information that you need to capture and that's part of your next steps. 
and you definitely need to discuss the action calendar and <laughs> always the survey, <laughs> so, always that, survey. so that we have information for next year. <laughs> <laughs> Number five, it's all about ending your event. So this is where you share your swag and you close on a high note. One of the best ways to end an event is super simple. Thank people. Thank you, thank you, thank you for coming. Thank you for participating. That's a time for the facilitator to thank people. That's a time for the host to step back in and thank people for showing up. Like, you, had, you, put, you put yourself out there and you opened up a space for people. You reserved a space. You opened up your home. You decided to convene people in another space that is important to you. Thank people for showing up for that. And people came, people signed up. And some people didn't sign up and they came anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, and people broke bread together and people sat around and had a conversation and people allowed you to be a host without participants. We don't get to be hosts or, fac or facilitators. So people allowed us to play the part that we signed up to play. Uh, so we thank them for that. So you definitely want to close on that high note. A thank you is always a high note. Like, that's great. Thank you so much for participating. I look forward to seeing you at the next thing. If that's what you said during your closing conversation, I look forward to talking to more of you. If you've asked for their contact information, let people know when they can expect a follow-up from you or when they can contact you, um, and then go from there. And then the very last thing that we want to ask, absolutely, is that you share your experience. So there will be social media tags, hashtag Common Ground CLE, hashtag CG2019. And then we'd love for you to share your feedback with us. Love, love, love. Feedback is super important. So there'll be the surveys, and there'll also be social media tags. That makes it super easy to share your pictures. So it's not like you like are taking pictures, and I'm saying my age now, you're taking pictures, and you gotta get them <laughs> developed, and then you share them. Take the picture and you can share it instantly on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. All those, yes. <laughs> Yeah, and um, in the guide, there's some, some other ways to contact the Clayton Foundation and the Common Ground team. There's phone number, email. You can, you can physically mail us things. I, we want your feedback. And when I say feedback, like we want to hear what your experience was like, the good and the bad, because every year we work on this to make it more effective, to make it more um, responsive to the needs of you, the hosts, and the people participating. That's really what Common Ground is about. These, these events are not Cleveland Foundation events. These belong to you, to the community, and we want to make sure that we're providing everything um, that you need to do that, and your feedback is essential to that. So that being said, um, you know, you can contact us in any number of ways or in all of the ways listed in the guide, and then we have the survey piece, which um, we've done every year, also um, a constant iteration this year. It will be a text message process where we're asking people to um, text to a certain number. Um, they will receive uh, several very brief text message questions that they will respond to, and then they'll receive a link to an online survey. Um, this survey, and I know we'll talk about it a little bit more, but I wanted to just um, chat about it really quickly. The survey is the only thing the Cleveland Foundation gets back from Common Ground. And it's very important to us to know and get an accurate picture of who is at your events and um, how did they find it and what are their priorities for being there. Um, so while it's not a, a super deep survey, the last few years it's been like uh, just over long and we heard that and we've, we've made changes. So um, this year we're going with something a little bit more tech savvy, a little bit more environmentally friendly for anybody who was familiar last year with the giant stacks of um, stapled paper surveys we gave out. Um, that being said, we will have paper surveys if you are working with folks who maybe don't have um, mobile or online connectivity. That's something you can contact us as the organizers and we can get that to you because we realize that um, we live in a city where there is a deep digital divide. Um, but we also want to be as environmentally conscious as possible. So we won't be providing those unless requested. So um, just a word to please um, help us get as much and as deep a, a dive of the survey into your participants as possible. So that is also a role of the host and the facilitator. Um, you'll receive a card as a part of your host kit that you would share with each participant that day. So, All right. Thank you.
Thank you. All right, so the next page on there, page eight, is really just about tips for quality conversations. And so this specifically came from the Facilitating Community Conversations resource guide, um, developed at CASE by Dr. Chep and the Community Innovation Network. <coughs> so these are challenges that can come up to facilitation. And in a perfect world, we all get to, you know, mingle around the room and glow as facilitators and everything is a positive conversation and everything moves exactly how we intended when we planned it with our hosts because, well, it's a plan. Um, but that doesn't necessarily happen all the time. So there could be other things that happen. Um, and there are some ways for you to deal with this. So the tips are actually in your guide on how to deal with it, like the actual explanation of how to deal with it. But I'll just like go over some of the ones that are, that have, that I know for sure happened last year. Uh, this, what if a smaller group shows up? What may happen on your Eventbrite page for hosts out there? And when you're planning with your facilitator, you may have 93 people sign up <laughs> for a conversation. You may purchase food for 93 people. You may have facilitators available for 93 people. And then 12 people show up at your conversation. Mm -hmm. But that's okay, because now you can donate food. Now you can send food home with other people. And also, now you can take a deeper dive into the conversation. And that's really, if you've arrived on time, which is early, and you've had this conversation, and you have like your huddle at the beginning, and you set your intentions, uh, once you realize that you have a smaller group as host and facilitator, now you know that, oh, instead of giving people 15 minutes to talk about each round of conversation, I can give people you know, 25 minutes to talk about each round of conversation. So you can adjust your timing that way. You can adjust how deep you go into each question that way. You can take a longer amount of time for reflection. You can take a longer amount of time for check-ins and check-outs. You can give people space to fill out the survey while they're sitting there with you. You can discuss other things about the next steps. So you have ways, you know, you can, you can end early so that everybody can go to the next conversation that they want to attend. So there are ways to work around it. It's not, you know, it's not a disaster at all. It could be exactly what was needed to be. One of the things that we talk about um, in facilitation when people talk about uh, open space, you know, whoever shows up is exactly who was supposed to show up. They're the right people. But every time it starts, it's when it was supposed to start. Uh, whatever happens is the only thing that could. And when it's over, it's over and you agree to follow up and do something at another date. And people are, of course, voting with their feet, so they've chosen to be in one conversation or chosen to be in another one, and that's okay. So if it ends half an hour early because you had a smaller group and you all accomplished so much and you're like, we're gonna go out and participate in other conversations and we'll get back together next week and figure out how we're gonna take over the world, then yes, let that happen, and it's okay. All right. Yeah. Just a quick note on this too. I know for the, for the hosts out there, you've probably heard from either Nicole or myself already about this as you're setting up your Eventbrite and setting up your registration pages. But um, the drop off is real. Uh, average common ground attendee drop off is about 50%. So if you want 20 people at your event, you should register 40. I know that's scary, but think about it this way. It's a Sunday. Um, you know, people register for things because they're excited, and then Sunday morning, and this has happened to everybody, they're like, man, I am comfy, <laughs> I'm in my pajamas, I'm not going to go to the 10 a.m. one, I'm going to go, that I registered for, instead I'm going to go to the 3 o'clock one. Um, everybody does it, we all know people do it, um, these events are free to the community, and that ups that factor, so um, just make sure, you know, you can prepare for, for that, and just plan on um, you will get half of the number that you have registered, and that's what everybody sees across the board. It has nothing to do with um, the value of your event or how interested people are. It's um, every single Cleveland Foundation event we host, because everything we host is usually free. We see that, even our annual meeting, which has 1,500 people, um, we register 3,000, and that's how it goes. So just a, just a quick note about that. All right. And Respecting time, because I'm looking at that. Yes. Um, I'm just going to go over one more quick one. Um, well, it's kind of two together. How do you handle disagreements or conflicting perspectives? And what if someone says something offensive? So you've got extensive notes right there about how to do it. But just some practical tips. 
much like being able to, because you plan and you already know what your host's intentions are and you set those and you are intentionally going through this conversation, it is okay to pause and invite people back into the conversation in a way that they can participate. Remind people, let them remember what we're here for. Remember the civility rules. And if that can't change the situation, if you can't de-escalate whatever is happening, as a host, it is okay to ask someone if they need time to separate themselves. As a facilitator, it's okay to ask people if they need a moment. Like, if this is something you'd like to talk about at a different time, that's fine. Um, if it gets, I haven't heard of anything like this happening ever, but I have to say what if, because I'm here for you as facilitators and hosts. But if it gets to that point where that can't be like mitigated and they can't participate in the conversation in a productive way any longer, it is okay to ask people to leave. And I feel like I have to say that not to bring any negativity in it or to rain on anybody's parade, but I think a lot of times, especially when things like that happen, when conflict comes up, if we are dead set on having a good event or having a good thing happen, it is hard for us to sometimes say, hey, this isn't working and it's okay for you to go. And so not that you need permission, but just know that that's an option so that you don't ever feel like, oh, I have to put up with this because I'm hosting this conversation. So yeah, that doesn't, being a host and being a facilitator, um, being a host doesn't mean that you have to tolerate everything. Being a facilitator doesn't mean that maintaining the integrity of, of the space means you have to figure out a way to fit something that doesn't fit in with the integrity of the space. It means that your first thing is to maintain the integrity of that space that you are holding for people. And if that doesn't fit at all, if there are behaviors, if there is language that doesn't fit at all, address it and name it. Like we've agreed to not behave this way. We've agreed that these are the ways that we're going to interact with each other. If this is not how you can participate, then I'm going to ask you to excuse yourself from the conversation. And it's okay to do that. So just know that, please. Please, 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 thank you. All right, are there any questions about tips for quality conversations so that we can move on to the after Common Ground? Yes. Or anything so anybody else wants to say? We have a quick question from Susan. So she asked, um, what was the experience with conflict or episodes of offensive behavior last year, or how likely is this? We, I haven't heard of any. Out of, what was it, 100 and, mm -hmm. 104 100 conversations last year? Last year? Mm -hmm. I didn't hear of any. The only thing, the only experience that anyone had that wasn't like absolutely awesome the whole time was really asking that board member to push pause on their presentation and participate in the conversation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so that was, and I, because I really think that one of the, so let me just go ahead and say this. One of the great things about getting together for Common Ground Conversations is that people are choosing conversations to participate in. Mm -hmm. They're putting themselves out there. Like that's a vulnerable space to be in. And I think people are less likely, like even if they don't agree, you've shown up because like it's called Common Ground. Mm -hmm. So what I think happens <laughs> is that people who are not remotely interested in finding common ground, people who are not remotely interested in hearing other points of view, they stay home or they go hang out with other anti-people all day long. <laughs> like they are, like they wake up and they're like, they're not like, I'm going to go to the 10 o'clock conversation. They wake up and they're like, I can't believe all those fools are out there talking to each other. And they stay home. Let, let me go disrupt it. <laughs> <laughs> they stay home. Yeah. I think so, that's been the experience across the board. Um, I'm sorry. Erica. No, you're fine. I mean, but that's a, I think that's good. I will say in the first year, there was a conversation where um, the, the way that the conversation went was not anticipated by the host or the participants because it was supposed, it was focused on um, the neighborhood environment and it turned into a, a very difficult racial equity conversation. And people at that conversation were caught unaware. They came to talk about the neighborhood, not thinking that it would turn into a, a difficult subject that I think some folks weren't ready to, to have. Um, but it was never, it never got to the place where it was, it was offensive or people weren't um, arguing. It was just uncomfortable for people who, who thought they were going to a different type of conversation. And I think that has happened and I think but I think that's also just what happens when you find common ground. Mm -hmm. is sometimes you find yourself learning new things and hearing things that you weren't prepared to hear 
or didn't, you know, you thought it was going to be one thing and then it was something else. And that's something we have to maintain space for, for people to have those experiences. But that does not mean we have to allow people to be offensive or, um, or to, to challenge, um, I don't know, in a way that's inappropriate. And I think that ultimately that decision can lie with the hosts and, and the facilitators. Yes. And yep. as hosts and facilitators who have shown up early and you have planned <laughs> together. And you are a team. And you are a team. You've set intentions together. You know what the host is expecting. You can also set those expectations at the beginning. If as a host you have chosen a conversation that might turn into, like we're talking about environment. If you start talking about environmental justice, race is going to come up. Mm -hmm. Neighborhoods are going to come up. Like sexism is going to come up. Like everything is going to come up. Like you know these things are going to happen. So in anticipation of those things happening, like you're not expecting it to go like poorly. You're just expecting that it's going to be a difficult conversation. It's going to be a challenging conversation. You already know that because you picked your topic. Work with your facilitator to set your intentions of what you want to get out of that conversation. Set those expectations from the beginning with the group. The people who signed up for that conversation don't expect it to be an easy conversation either. Mm -hmm. It's okay to set that expectation and then to manage it throughout the conversation. Mm -hmm. And it's okay to give people even more time to reflect mm -hmm. because there will be more to reflect on. Right. And it's really okay to keep addressing the civility rules. Like we're going to remind each other to speak from experience. Like speak, you can only speak from your own experience. Um, it's okay to, you're going to question kindly. Like we're going to keep going back to that and being respectful of each other. It's okay to keep reminding people of that as the conversation goes deeper. Um, you're not expecting it to be a super easy, super happy conversation. What you are expecting is that the people who showed up knew what they were showing up for and that there are certain expectations for how we will conduct ourselves during the conversation and how we will be together in this conversation. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. It's also okay to remind people in the form of setting expectations and managing expectations because that's a whole other role of a facilitator. Mm -hmm. um, that just because you're uncomfortable doesn't mean it's not a good conversation. Right. It doesn't mean it's not a safe conversation. There has been a gravitation away from saying that things are safe to saying that it's a brave space or that you have it like this is this is a brave space that we're in because everything that makes you uncomfortable doesn't make you unsafe. You're just uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And if I'm showing up for a conversation that could go that way, I probably should be a little bit prepared for being uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And it's okay to let people know that. And it's okay to let people know that even if you're uncomfortable, you can pause, you can take a break, you can remember the civility rules, you can take notes, you can participate in the way that you want to participate in, but like it's not going to shut down the conversation. You can right. breathe. You can breathe. <laughs> and you can listen to understand. Yes. 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 Remind yourself of those those buttons sometimes look at other people's buttons because you may be feeling something that someone else is feeling and either they may be willing to voice that and it's like Whoo, oh i'm so happy i'm not the only one in this space feeling that or you may step into brave uh, into your own bravery and say hey i just need to voice this right now and again using using that wonder i am feeling a certain type of way about where this conversation is going, not to pause it, but literally just to say, I am giving voice and weight to this experience that I'm having right now. Mm -hmm. um, and I am stepping into wonder around it. Mm -hmm. um, why do I feel this way? I'm questioning that. Right. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so on page nine, um, the ending, instructions for hosts and facilitators is really about talking to people about what the next steps are that they can take. So remember, as part of your closing, you're going to point people towards the after common ground calendar. And so we're calling it an action planning calendar. And there are a, couple, a few categories there, three to be exact. Um, are you ready to make a plan? So if people have been sitting at this conversation and the host expectation was that people are gonna move from this into action, we're gonna take a next step. Even if that wasn't the host's intention, if people who are sitting at the tables have come to some point in their conversation where they're saying, oh, you know what? We really should get together and move this forward. Like we all really want to do the next thing after having this conversation. We've realized that we can all act in different ways and we're gonna put that energy together. 
then there's an action clinic calendar there. At Neighborhood Connections, we will be hosting an action clinic on July 2nd. So that is seriously two days after Common Ground is over. So be very clear to people, like action clinic, you can come to two days after. So if you've had a conversation with somebody and you're ready to go, you don't have to wait a long time. Tuesday evening, six to eight at Neighborhood Connections, please be there. And I will be facilitating that action <laughs> planning session. Looking for partners. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we will also be on, because this is going across counties and across the city and neighborhoods, um, July 9th, one week later, there will be one at the Cuyahoga County Public Library, the Parma Snow Branch. July 16th, for our Lake County folks, or anyone else who wants to come. I had people from Shaker come to that one last year. Um, July 16th, we'll be at the Hive at Lakeland Community College. When you pull up, it's the super cool building that looks like there are really cool things inside behind all that glass. Mm -hmm. That's exactly where I will be, probably in the area that has like all the like making stuff and cushions. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and then August 6th, we'll be back at Neighborhood Connections for our monthly action clinic um, at the regular time, 6 to 8 p.m. Um, and these will be just, uh, can we give them folks a rundown of, of what sort of will happen in an action clinic and how mm -hmm. this one, these will be different because they will involve our good friend Don. Absolutely. <laughs> Am I going to be at all of these? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so these will be a little bit. <laughs> a question of wonder. <laughs> so, so first, I'll say what they are. So Action Clinic is a place to come with when you have an idea. So you're like, I have an idea. We're ready to make a plan. Or I have a group of people, and we need to figure out what our plan is. Like we decided at Common Ground, we're going to do something next. Um, so the way that you're, as hosts and facilitators, the way that you're talking to your participants about it is, if you've come up with a great idea here, or if you've already started your plan and your conversations afterwards, this is where you go to flesh it out. So what happens in an action clinic is like generally, we walk through a process, we have a planning process for how to create a plan to move from idea to action. So it's really about taking the ideas, if, if someone comes in and they say, um, after going to Common Ground, this is what I want to do for the environment. This is what I want to do on my street. This is what I want to do in this part of my neighborhood. Then that's exactly what we go from what it is that you want to do to the steps that it takes to get you to actually do it. And that is, it is very, it is very cut and dried in that way that this is a way to sit down and go from idea to actual plan to actually take an action. So it's no longer just, well, I had this great conversation, but there was no follow-up. This is follow-up and follow-through to actually doing the thing that you say you want to do. Or if you're trying to figure out how to do something to make a difference, that's also a place where you can come because we can talk about your ideas and then we can move into action. All right, the next one is all about funding. Yay, funding! Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So if you need funding, so Neighborhood Connections and the Neighborhood Action Grant is specifically for Cleveland and East Cleveland. So it's all 20 plus neighborhoods in Cleveland and then the city of East Cleveland. So we have our regular grantee workshops. Like, so if you're looking to seek a grant for Neighborhood Connections, our grant deadline for the regular round of funding is the second Friday in August. And so people who are in Cleveland and East Cleveland, if you're having your conversations there, or you know that people who are in your conversations live in Cleveland and East Cleveland, then they can participate in that round of funding um, in order to apply for funding for the things that they want to put into action. If they are outside of Cleveland and East Cleveland, or even if they are in Cleveland and East Cleveland, another option is IOB. IOB. <laughs> And also, you'll see under the Do You Need Funding uh, that there is an IOB Crowdfunding 101 webinar uh, on July 11th. So that will be hosted by yours truly, and we will have the um, link for sign up uh, very, very soon. I'm learning the system. Um, <laughs> um, and so at the bottom there, we have Do You Have an Idea? Um, so we are calling these ideation happy hours um, to share your ideas or receive feedback from other folks. IOB is not limited to just Cleveland and East Cleveland. Um, my general area kind of includes uh, Cuyahoga County, but for Common Ground, we are including the other two counties, um, which are Lake and Lake Cuyahoga. Cuyahoga. Okay, awesome. Um, but, you know, 
we'll figure it out if you're out west we can still talk to you um, so <laughs> so we have three ideation happy hours um, so one is an actual happy hour at the happy dog on August 14th and these are all when Wednesdays Thursdays something like that um, but they're all on the same day for three weeks in a row. So we have the uh, happy hour at the happy dog and uh, come and get a drink on me and eat some tater tots. Um, <laughs> and then August 21st, there's gonna be an ice cream social at the Buckeye Green Infrastructure uh, Project. It is right at the uh, apex, I guess. That's the apex of where Shaker Boulevard begins um, and Buckeye Road comes together and there's a beautiful green infrastructure project there done by the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District. Um, and I will buy you ice cream. Um, and, and we have an ice cream truck, so that's awesome. And then August 28th, Family Fun Night at the Midtown Tech Hive. Uh, that is located in Midtown Cleveland. Um, and we're still figuring out what all is going to be there, but I'm hoping to have some hula hoops. Um, I know, right? What? And yes, hula hoops <laughs> and, and ways for you to, you know, I think hula hooping is a great way to get your brain working, to think about ideas. And so we also recognize that um, sometimes you're not ready to jump into having a plan where you just have this idea or something that's sitting with you and then the idea kind of kind of spurs. Um, and so we wanted to provide space for that. IOB is a crowdfunding platform. So this is not a grant. Um, you will be um, coached by myself on how to organize your community around raising money about something that you believe in. I did my own Common Ground IOB project last year um, around literacy um, and it was great and it was fun and I'm still distributing comic books to this day around that project. Um, and so again, your environment um, has a very broad definition and it is something personal and passionate to you um, and or the people who are attending your conversation. Um, so I want to I want to emphasize that um, hosts, facilitators, and participants are all welcome to any of these things, and we are encouraging you to make sure that um, that everyone has some information about where they can go if they want to continue this conversation, or if something um, is I don't want to say triggered, but if something is uh, boiling up something that's sitting with you and you want to do something about it these are places that you can turn to get supports for them and just a little bit of history about um this sort of action planning assistance that we built into converse into common ground with the help of neighbor up and iobi is that um in our first year um we had about we had 43 sites uh in 2017 across just cuyahoga county and people were fired up they were really excited after the conversation um, but we received a lot of messages and notes afterwards that people kind of, they had these experiences and then that was it. And there was no clear next step for them to take following Common Ground. And so with Neighbor Ups and AOB's help, we have um, built this structure. And when I say we've built it, that's totally incorrect because IOB and Neighborhood Connections and Neighbor Up have been doing this work for years. And we're already there. And so what we're hoping is to use um, the Common Ground umbrella to get more people in contact with the work that they're doing. So as a part of the action um, support, the foundation is issuing match, small match grants through Neighborhood Connections, um, I'm sorry, action grants through Neighborhood Connection, Neighborhood Connections, Neighbor Up. Yeah. And, <laughs> oh, yes, yes, <laughs> say both. <laughs> and um, crowdfunding matches through IOB. So, these, exp these schedule that we shared are just, you don't have to have a, my, my idea that I'm gonna jump on right then. These are a great opportunity that if you make, a, you make a great connection at your conversation and you say, well, we wanna get together again, why don't we meet at the ice cream social? You know, I think, and there you don't know where that's going to take you. Um, maybe you will meet somebody else who has shared interests and then you can all work together on, on a project together. So I think it's just another way to continue the connection um, and get things done. 
And so we last year we were incredibly uh, just overwhelmed by the response. We ended up with over 50 projects um, and gave out about $27,000 to support. I think um, the, the grant pool this year is even larger. So we're really excited to see what the community builds with this, these tools. And thank you for the work you guys are doing on that. Um, thank you. I think it's fantastic to know that, that there's matching funds available for what you engage through IOB. And those matching funds are done in real time. I think it's really important to make sure that we um, emphasize that as well. So this is a first come, first serve um, drawdown account. So it happens in real time. If someone donates $20 to your project, the great selling point is that you can tell them that it is instantly turned into $40 and every dollar counts. Um, and it is, it, it, it's super important. And Stephanie, I love that idea. Meet me at the ice cream social. Why not? Right. Yeah. Like it's continue to wonder out right. loud about right. it. Yeah. yeah. So facilitators, you have another tool. There you go. <laughs> see, <laughs> you see if some folks who are having a really great conversation suggest they, they come together again. You know, there are there is between um, June thirtieth and August twenty eighth, there, you know, there's a dozen opportunities for people to get back together in a in a group. Um, they don't have to do it on their own. And I wanna say all of these events are family and kid friendly. Yes. 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 Let's be very clear. <laughs> let, let, it, let us be very clear that we are not putting up barriers to participation. We are knocking them down. And so bring your three-year-old in the dinosaur. And with the dinosaur shirt. With the dinosaur shirt. That's right. It doesn't have to be clean either. Exactly. Uh, but it probably won't be. It probably won't be. That's fine. But please bring, bring the family, bring the friends. If you, you know, if that's what you have to do, we're here for it. And sometimes the best ideas come from kids wearing dinosaur shirts. It's so true. Um, she does have great ideas. She does have great ideas. <laughs> and so just to go back a little bit to the funding part, I just wanted to make sure I put out there so that facilitators and hosts know to put this out there also so that for Cleveland and East Cleveland, it's not just the regular grant cycle for Neighborhood Connections and the Neighbor of Action grant. That's the second Friday in August for that deadline. Those grants are between $500 and $5,000, and those go on a regular twice a year cycle. There will also be action grants specifically for Common Ground, and those will go up to $500. So if you come off and you immediately want to come into Action Clinic on that following Tuesday, you're from Cleveland or East Cleveland, and you've got an idea, and you want to make a plan, and this needs to get funded right now because I'm thinking about it right now, um, you can apply for funding for up to $500 to do that really quickly. So that's a quick turnaround on that one. Um, and the other one goes through the regular process because it's a much larger amount of money. Right. Any questions about that process? Thanks. Um, as a part of your host kit, you will receive a calendar as well as um, a neighbor up calendar, some IOB information, most likely, and um, some things to, to give to participants so they can take these with them. But we ask that you do build in some time at the end of your conversation to share this um, because I think it's still new to Common Ground and not everybody knows that it's offered. And when people do find out that, that it is offered, they are really excited. So please help us by sharing that. Helps end on a high note. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing ends on a high note, like uh, telling people they can get match grants. <laughs> All right, and so on the last page is there, you just have some of the projects that came out of last year. Um, so one project, um, that came out of Common Ground last year was Make Art Talk Community Building. And it was actually part of the Neighbor Up Network's conversations. And Ms. Gwen Garth had a conversation in an art garden where she brought together tons of different people to have a conversation over art and a meal. Uh, they created art while they talked about what it takes to build community for the theme last year. They are going to do a similar conversation again this year about uh, using the environment was, is, and will be prompts. Um, and they went through each one of those. That's an example of people who went through each one of those processes. So when and the king, kings and queens of art hosted the Common Ground conversation, they sent facilitators to be trained for the conversation. Then they went on to apply for the mini grant of up to $500 and then also applied in the regular round of Neighborhood Connections funding. So that went full circle for that group to be able to do each one of those steps and to be able to access the money available for that. So that's just an example. You have other projects on there. Um, there's also the previous, from the presentation from the fall, mm -hmm. if you want 
something about that, just ask. Um, but there was also uh, a number of other projects, and you'll be able to link to that. We had an awesome breakfast where we talked about all of that. <laughs> yeah, and that's a good point. We will, um, after Common Grounds, it's, all a lot, it's often the question, so what's, what's next? And so last year we hosted a recap meeting um, in October. Was it in October? Yes. Gosh, it feels like it was yesterday. But um, uh, we'll be doing that again and sharing out the information that we received from the survey. Um, sort of stories from hosts and um, just different examples and, and stories of the projects and the things that, that get done after Common Ground. So we'll be doing that um, this fall, so stay tuned. Let me make another uh, push to everyone to please, please read your host newsletters because those um, are where you will receive a ton of really important information about things that are coming up in the upcoming months. It feels like June 30th is kind of far away, but it is really not. It's going to be here before you know it. Um, so, you know, keep in, keep in touch with us and keep your eyes on our host newsletter when it comes through because that's where all the, the, the information you need will be. So I think we're going to wrap up. I think so. I think we're almost done. Are there any more questions from anyone? Yeah, let's open it up real quick for some questions and I will show you just a couple more things that will um, are being offered just to our facilitators and hosts as sort of a little bit of a thank you. So these are just a few important details and dates and opportunities I wanted to make sure we share with everybody. Um, as you know, registration is open now. People are registering for uh, locations. So uh, if you're still working on your site, get it up as quickly as possible because registration is happening. Um, if you haven't registered to host yet and you're interested in hosting, please register as soon as possible um, because that registration for new hosts closes on June 17th. So that gives you three weeks um, right now to do that at this point. So we do that because it's really hard to make sure everybody gets their host kits and we get all of the logistics together. Um, to help support each individual event. So um, if you haven't registered, do, do so now. Um, we have a, a whole host of different Fred Walks and uh, events leading up to Common Ground that will be happening. You can see the full list at commongroundclee.org, which is where you will also find your events. But we have a very special opportunity that is being donated to us by the Cuyahoga Valley National Park. They have opened up a train car on their scenic railway to common ground hosts and facilitators um, the night of Monday, June 17th. Uh, it's, so it's a beautiful trip through the National Park on the train. It starts at seven, you meet at Rockside Station 30 minutes before, so at 6.30 please, look for the common ground sign. Um, this is special just for us, um, they offer the ride for the community and they're, they're offering this to us. Please bring your families and please register. So the link is here, it's, um, copy that down. I will share this slide deck with the group so you have this if you need it. Um, and this will also be in your host news that are coming out soon. And finally, just a few more details about that common ground uh, action support and the time frame for that. So um, those are just the last few things I wanted to make sure everybody had. Um, We'll stick around for a few minutes, so please uh, chat your questions if you have anything left. Thank you so much for your time. I know that this is a little bit of a slog to, to be online for, for several hours um, and listening, but we appreciate your patience and your attention and your thoughtfulness, and uh, can't wait to see what you all create on June 30th. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.